an understatement to say we're in a pretty bad time in the US right now. I'm not going to go into much you know who babble, but I'd like you to think about how you've been able to get your disapproval or your concern across. More specifically, I'd like you to think about how you've been able to call your rep. What are the steps you take? OK, so you Google, how do I call my rep? You get a bunch of Google results. You click on one website. You type in your address. And there you have it. You have the names and the address and the phone numbers of whoever you need to call to let them know how you think they're doing. Not too long ago, I read a New Yorker article about doing exactly this. It said, of all the liberties granted by the First Amendment to the United States Constitution, the most underrated by far is the right to complain to your elected officials. And if you think about it, it's a really important right to be able to call up the office of insert Republican senator here and say, you know, hi, Ms. Senator, I'd really like you to rethink your decision to take away my health care. <laughs> it's a right many of you, I'm sure, don't think about. It's expected you should be able to call up your rep and let them know how you think they're doing. But imagine what it would be like if you didn't have access to their phone numbers, their email, their address, their Twitter handles, if once they got elected, they just went to this black hole. Meanwhile, everything was crumbling around you. That's how I feel when I go back home to Nigeria. I was born there. I came to the US for school. Nigeria is a very beautiful country, a very rich country, but with many poor people. It's a nation of deprivation. So you have high mortality rates, high unemployment rates, um, bad infrastructure, bad health care, bad roads. Um, in 2015, it was reported that 23 out of the 36 states had left their civil servants unpaid for months on end. Meanwhile, our politicians among the wealthiest in the world as a, as a multiple of GDP per capita. So you have the average income of a politician in Nigeria is $184,000, which is 116 times the average income of a person in the country. In the US, however, the average income of a politician is $174,000, which is just 3.7 times the average income of a person in the country. And what makes it worse is this feeling that we can't do anything about it. A lot of Nigerians feel like they're in the dark about what the government is doing, what policies are being put in place, and why. Why that road hasn't been fixed. Why there hasn't been life for two weeks. Um, it's literally like we're in a dark room. We have this general, this collective sense that something is going wrong. We can hear it. We can feel it. It's consuming us, but we can't do anything about it. So if you were in this situation, if you were in a dark room and you knew something bad was happening, what would you do? You would turn the lights on. Well, that's what data does. It turns the lights on if it can be understandable and if it can be accessible. So we need to make data understandable and accessible. How can we do that? Before I go into that, I want to talk about my studies at Gallatin and how I got here. When I transferred to Gallatin, I knew I wanted to combine my love for the arts with my love for the sciences. And this was a bit difficult considering how we separate the two. When we talk about art, we talk about beauty and aesthetics and emotion and all these wonderful things. When we talk about science, we talk about investigation and utility and data. But again, I wanted to combine the two. So one of the first classes I took at Gallatin was teaching this program called Processing, which is a creative coding platform, essentially allowing you to use code to create art and I encountered, I discovered many other platforms like this, like p5.js, which you see on the screen, and open frameworks, all with the purpose of making it easier for you to create art using code. And I also discovered many thoughtful, beautiful artists making thoughtful work in the realm of art and code. One of them is this organization called Field Train, and they created a bot, which is an automated program that allows you to relive the Obama administration. <laughs> <laughs> so the, the Obama administration is making their social media data publicly available. So this bot is going to take that data and tweet out on the time schedule, essentially <laughs> allowing you to believe that we're still in the Obama era. <laughs> and I thought this was particularly interesting because it's providing this window in the, into the past and creating a world at least a subset of us want to see. The second project is by a studio called Design.io, and they created Connected Worlds, which is an interactive immersive ecosystem. And what that means is it's based on this idea of look, please touch, instead of look, don't touch. Um, so in this ecosystem, um, you can grow plants. And there are these blocks on the ground that respond to motion. So you move them around to change the flow of the water. And what you discover playing with this installation is that you can't get water to every side of the forest. So you have to make decisions about what plants you want to thrive and what you're willing to let die. Yeah, you can see them moving the blocks. The third project is by this artist called Carolina Sobeka, and she created a personal emission visualizer called PUP. 
and it's a cartoon, it's shaped like a cartoon cloud and it attaches near the exhaust pipe of your car and it dynamically changes color according to how much pollution is being produced. And this is an example of a data visualization or what Albert Cairo, who is a prominent data journalist that teaches at the University of Miami, would call the functional art. So data visualization is quite simply just representing um, data in a visual, in a graphical format. Um, as early as the second century, we were putting data into tables, but it wasn't until the late 17th century that René Descartes, who's a French mathematician, created the two-dimensional coordinate system with the x and the y axis for showing the relationship between variables. In the 18th century, William Playfair designed a lot of the graphs we see today, like the pie chart, like the pie graph, and the line chart, and the bar chart. And then in 1983, Edward Tufte published the groundbreaking book, The Visual Display of Quantitative Information. Since then, data visualization has become incorpor incorporated into many news organizations, articles like the New York Times and The Guardian. I've been particularly interested in data visualization because it struck me as the emergence of a practice that combined the aesthetics and the emotional part of art with the investigative side of the sciences. Um, what is not understandable um, when presented as text or numbers in a table becomes so much more understandable when presented in a graphical format. Our eyes work very quickly and efficiently. Um, our visual cortex works much more fast, works faster than our cerebral cortex, which is in charge of our thinking. We see almost immediately with, with very little effort. So data, visualiz data visualization allows us to take advantage of our powerful eyes and unlock and discover the insights and the patterns and the stories that are hidden in data visualization. This would be so much more difficult if data was presented just in a spreadsheet. Take for example this. How long would it take you to sift through this and find any kind of meaning or understand what it was trying to tell you versus if it was presented in this format? And this is a visualization about police shootings in the US. Same goes for this data set. How long would it take you to sift through 500 rows of information to get any form of insight versus if it was presented in this format? And this is a visualization about gun deaths in the US. So what I've been interested in lately is trying to use data visualization to bridge the information gap between the citizen and the government in Nigeria. Um, as we saw in the Call Your Rep example, citizen access to information is the bedrock of a democracy and fundamental if we're going to be able to hold our politicians accountable. The idea I've been working most on is based on this idea of a recycled politician. And it's something we talk about a lot in Nigeria. It's a problem that's made clear when put in context with other data. So um, when we think about the corruption in the country, Nigeria ranks 46 on the list of 176 nations on the corruption index. Um, so these politicians doing their extended runs in government are stealing money from the country. We've lost tens of billions of dollars to corruption over the years. Um, and they're using it to send their children to school. This money that could be used to better the country, to better, to better healthcare, to make sure we have light as being put in the pockets of these politicians and shared from generation to generation. Secondly, one put in context with the data about the population of a country, 50% of the population of the country is under the age of 30. So we're losing access to these valuable and novel ideas in the minds of the youth by deterring them from entering government. Thirdly, when we think about the deprivation that I mentioned earlier, so we're putting our country back in the hands of the people who have shown an inability to run it. Um, so I've been collecting data about politicians, how long they served in office, what positions they had, um, and putting it in context with data with what was going on in that sector, in that city, in that state, in the country during their time. So how much money was being stolen when they were in that position, um, the things that were supposed to get done that didn't. And I'm putting this data together and trying to make a visualization in the hope that as a country we can go from information and knowledge to action. And I want to end with this wonderful quote by Hans Rosling, and he said, let the data set change your mindset. And if it can do that, maybe it can change your behavior. Thank you.